All right, well, we are wrapping up our series called What's Love Got to Do With It? Now, every time you've seen that, you've seen it come up, every time you've seen this graphic, what instantly pops in your head? Tina Turner, right? Obviously. You can't hear what's love got to do with it without thinking of Tina Turner. And I've been ignoring it because I've been trying to avoid it. But Mia will simply will not let me avoid it. She keeps asking me every week, Joel, are you going to sing the song? Joel, are you going to sing the song? Now, I know most of you don't want that, but Mia wants to hear it. And so what I thought would be great is if Mia came up and joined me, because that's only fair. So come on up, Mia. This is payback. All right, ready? We're going to do on four. Because that's what music is. So we'll do one, two, three, four, and then you're gonna mostly take it. No, you're gonna sing loud. <laughs> sing loud for all to hear, like Elf says. Yes. Yeah. You're gonna sing loud. You're gonna sing. You're gonna sing loud. All right, here we go. One, two, three. What's, what's love got to do? You can join. Got, got to do with it. Oh. What's love but a second? Hand. See, that's it. Oh, Nobody up. knows the song other than the first line of the song. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> All right, that's it. Nobody knows that song. Here's the deal. Tina Turner wrote that song. What was crazy in 1982, she wrote this song. It quickly rose to the charts. But here's the crazy part. What she wrote in that song was just basically this. And if you've read the lyrics to the song, it's a horrible song. It really is. Like, it's sad. It's sad because what she was grappling with was an abusive marriage. And what she got out of that abusive marriage was basically this. She, she exited after years of an abusive marriage with her stage name and two cars, and that was it. And so when she wrote this song, she was thinking about that, and all she basically boiled it down to, she was saying this, all love is, is physical, so get as much out of the physical as you can get because there's nothing else love is. That's the message of that song. And that's exactly opposite of what we've been learning in this series, right? Because what we've been learning in this series is, is, is biblical love. What Paul writes about and what Jesus displays is that love isn't just this physical connection between two people. But what love is, is a deep, unconditional love of God who pours out his love on us and then looks at us and says, I want you to love like that. See, 1 Corinthians 13, we've been saying it all along in the series that although it's often read at weddings, in fact, you've heard these words at weddings, right? Love is patient and kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way or irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Always love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then we all know how it ends, right? Love never fails, right? And we've heard that a lot. But Paul was not writing this to a, uh, to a wedding. He was writing this to a church who was struggling to love each other. They were struggling to put love into action, they were making love about themselves and what they could get from it rather than, than what Christ displayed as love. And so through this series, we've just been looking at different elements of love. and We haven't had a chance to go through each one of them, but um, today we're wrapping up the series with the idea that love endures all things. Love endures all things. This word endure, it's interesting uh, in the Greek um, it comes from the word, it's a compound word called uh, hupomeneo, hupomeneo. And that's, it's two words put into one. That's what a compound word is. I don't know much English, but I do know that. Um, I was paying attention a little bit in school. Uh, hupo, um, hupo means under, and meno means um, to, to abide or to stay. Hupomeneo means to abide or remain under, to stay steadfast. The idea, the picture that it's given in Scripture, it's that someone who, uh, it's some kind of thing that, that um, somebody who will stay under an incredibly heavy load and refuse to stray from his position because their commitment to the task. In other words, Regardless of the load or the opposition or the stress or the weight or the, the problems, 
What it means to endure is means that you will abide under or stay under strain or stress. You're not going to surrender, that you're not going to tap out easily. As we look around at the world today, as we look at, around at relationships today, that people who say they love one another, sometimes we, I fail to see hupomeneo. That in relationships and, in, and, and even in marriages and in, par- and, and in, and in uh, friendships and, and in the church even, when there's conflict arising, when, when, when there's people uh, that, that you don't get along with or you're having a stri- struggle or a strife with or, or there's a misunderstanding, we're, f- we're pretty quick these days to just kind of bail out, be like, well, They offended me because you all know this, right? The greatest uh, wrong you could do in the world today is be offended, right? And so when somebody offends you, it's like, I'm out of here, right? Because we don't have the, we don't have the endurance that, 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 that Paul talks about. But what he says here is that love endures what? All things. Huh. That seems pretty inclusive, Right? All doesn't give us a lot of wicked w- wiggle room in there, right? That doesn't mean like, oh, I've been, a, I've been hurt, I've been offended, I'm out. This is love sticks with it. Love remains under. Love goes on. And that kind of love is the love that Paul's saying never fails. And all throughout this series, right, we've been... Um, We've been looking at the life of Jesus as the example. We've been saying what Paul has said in 1 Corinthians 13, but then we've been going back to the Gospels and just seeing how Jesus lives this out to the fullest because we know this from 1 John, right? 1 John tells us that God is love. So by very definition, God is the definition of love. You want to know what love is? Look at God because he defines it. And so if we want to know who God is, we look at Jesus. So to, throughout the series, we've been looking at Jesus to find out what love looks like. And he shows us what love looks like perfectly. And there's no clearer picture of Jesus enduring love than on the cross of Christ, right? And the cross of Calvary, and it's interesting that we land here this week, right? Ahead of Holy Week, ahead of this time of year where we where we do focus on um, the cross. And and I can't wait until next Sunday where we can talk about the resurrection because that's that's the the awesome celebration of the resurrection. But this week, we're gonna talk about the cross quite a bit. Today, we're gonna talk about it, and then on on, on Friday, we're gonna look at it from a little bit different angle as well. And so as we look at Jesus, though, um, The writer of Hebrews declares that Jesus' love for humanity through endurance happens on the cross. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. I love this passage. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice what he says. He endured the cross. He, he, the writer of Hebrews invites us to consider exactly what Jesus went through, and Jesus chose to love by enduring the cross. Jesus chose the cross. Did you notice what he said here? He said, for the joy of set before him. Do you ever consider what the joy set before him was? It's you. He says, for the joy set before Jesus, the joy that he's talking about, the jo- the, the, what, what kept Jesus going on the cross, the passion that fueled the endurance through the pain of the cross and was knowing that, the, knowing that freedom was coming for you and I through his death, burial, and resurrection. The joy set before Jesus, the, the joy that kept Jesus going and enduring through on the cross was knowing that you and I could experience freedom. 
that God would demonstrate his love. Nothing demonstrates God's love more powerfully than the cross. Because don't get this wrong, Jesus wasn't forced to die. What kept Jesus on the cross was his love for you and for me. That passion fueled Jesus. Jesus wasn't overpowered or outnumbered or tricked into death. He chose the cross because he loves you and he loves me. Jesus' passion, uh, passionate love took him to the cross through the pain, the humiliation, the separation, the, all that entailed on the cross meant victory for you and I. And so Jesus kept going. He kept enduring. And, and don't get me wrong, that was an endurance, right? There was an endurance that had to take place because it didn't just start on the cross. If, as you've been reading through the Gospels, and I hope that this week you'll read through kind of the last week of Jesus' life, and you can find that in the Gospel of John and in, in all the Gospels towards the end of the book. Um, but John lays out the last week of Jesus' life very clearly, but but we look through the last minute, the, the last week of Jesus' life, and you, you could just tell that the, the intensity was ratcheting up, right? And he continues to endure because of love. He continues to go through all that he went through because of the joy set before him. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26 today. If you um, got your Bible I'm just going to read a couple things because what I want to show you is this. this um, as you go through these last moments of Jesus' life, I want to show you that he was pretty much abandoned by all the people that said that loved him. That he was bailed out or he was bailed on by everybody that he had poured into. And yet, by even by getting bailed on over and over, he chose love because he, his love endured. He continued to remain under even though he kept getting sold out again and again. Notice the first place in Matthew chapter 26. Um, it's not gonna be on the screen, but if you got your Bible, you can look at it. Starting in verse 36, 26, 36. When Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face praying, saying, Father, and my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if it, this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came uh, and found them sleeping again, for, uh, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same words. And he came to the disciples and said, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer at hand. We'll pause there. Jesus, it says that he is sorrowful even to death. He is struggling, right? We know that Jesus was fully God and fully man, right? That it, God, Jesus was the word become flesh. He was God be put on skin. He, 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 he came, but here in his many, knowing what was before him, knowing what the cross would entail for him, he was struggling in his humanity. He said he was sorrowful. And the disciples should have seen this. They should have seen this. They, they, they did see it, right? And Jesus just, he takes, he leaves part of the disciples and he takes three with them and he goes a little further. The, the three closest guys that, that he has poured into over and over and again, Peter, James, and John, right? Brings them up and he's like, hey, pray with me here. Sit and pray. 
And he goes a little further, stones throw away, not very far away. And he's having this intense conversation with God and he comes back and they're sleeping. What? And Jesus, you could tense his frustration, right? He's like, you couldn't stay awake for an hour? I need you guys. Don't, please, just, just stay awake, pray. You're gonna need it. You're gonna need it more than I am. But I need you to be ready. And he goes away, comes back an hour later. And they're sleeping again. And have you ever needed somebody to come through for you? Like you needed them to come through for you because you were struggling, you were sorrowful, and then they just bailed. That's what Jesus is doing, has having happened to him right here. And yet, you see how it ended? He comes back a third time and he says, guys, it's okay, let's go. The betrayer's here. What is he talking about? You drop down a little bit further. Verse 47, it says this, while he was still speaking, so like as this is happening, right, as he's saying, guys, like it's happening, right now it's happening, while he's still speaking, Judas comes. One of the 12, and with him a great crowd, and swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders and the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, notice that word friend, do what you came to do. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. As he's dealing with the three guys that he thought he could count on, not being able to be counting on them, then one of the 12, Judas, one of the guys that had been with him through all that he's seen, all, they saw all the miracles. He saw all the things, same things that the other disciples saw. We know this, right? He sells, sells Jesus out, betrays him, sells him out for 30 pieces of silver, puts a plan into place to betray Jesus and hand him over to be killed. Can you imagine the betrayal that must have been? Can you imagine Jesus in this moment? Like, if Jesus is you and I at this point, right? Even his closest people are bailing on him, right? If it's you and I, for a lot less, we've written off people before, right? For a lot less than what these guys did to Jesus on that night, we've just said, forget it. I'm not gonna love you anymore. You're out, right? You've hurt me too bad, you're out, Right? And yet Jesus, fueled by love, chose to endure through. We know there's a scuffle that took place. At some point, Peter pulls out a sword and chops off a guy's ear, and Jesus puts the ear back on. You should read the Bible. It's, it's full of great, great, great things. But if you drop down, one of the most telling things we can read out of Matthew chapter 26 is verse 56 when it says this. But all this had taken place to, uh, that the, the scriptures and the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. After all Jesus has done for them, after all the love that he's poured out, after all the times Jesus is in the toughest spot of his life, and everybody close to him bails. Have you felt like that before? People close to you are bailing on you. I don't know what you guys do when that moment comes, but here's what I'm tempted to do. Forget them. I don't need them anyway. Right? That's my kind of reaction. It's like, they want to go, fine. I don't care. But I write them off. Right? And I struggle to love them the way God's calling me to. Man, Jesus, they all fled, they all left. And then we know from there, right, he was put in front of a mock trial. And while this is happening, Peter's out in the courtyard. He gets confronted by a few people. He denies, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. He swears that he didn't even know Jesus. 
One of the guys that just less than 12 hours earlier said, There's n- I'll never disown you, Lord. 12 hours later, he's denying him three times, selling his best friend and savior down the stream. Then Jesus was mocked and beaten and whipped, and yet his love endured, and he still chose love. Then he was brought out before the people, the people who were just a week earlier saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, right? In other words, what they're saying, Jesus, we, we're worshiping you. Save us. The, that same crowd that was saying those words five days earlier are now in a crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus chose love. They mocked him. They hung him on a cross. And then they mocked him on the cross even, right? They said, if you have any power, come on down from there. Guys, and we'll talk about this on Friday too. Jesus could have. Jesus had all the authority to come off that cross, whip all their butts, stomp on them, and say, oh yeah, all right? You deserve that, Right? He, he had the power, and they were mocking him. They were, they were saying, hey, hey, if you have any power, they're, they're testing, they're, they're questioning his power. And yet, for love's sake, Jesus chose to endure for love, for you and for me. What we see in the Gospels is this. This is crazy, guys. I was just struck by this even again this week. Of all 12 disciples... Only one of them show up to the cross. John. Only one. Only one guy even shows up. After all Jesus did. At what point, right? At what point do you and I say, forget these fools, man? These people don't deserve this. They don't deserve salvation. They don't deserve freedom from their sins. They deserve to die because they're selling me out. They can't even show up. Yet Jesus chose love. And what what it means when Jesus chose love is that many he chose to endure. On the cross, he felt Abandoned by the Father, and yet he chose love. You see, on the cross, Jesus reveals what love is described in 1 Corinthians 13, what we've been looking at all series long. On the cross, Jesus shows that love is patient, and love is kind. And and, and love love, um, is humble. Oh, it was Jesus was so humble when he, laid, when he was up on that cross. And, it, and love puts other people first. Jesus put all of humanity first in that moment. And Jesus shows what love is by, re, by rejoicing in the truth of salvation in that moment. Not rejoicing in the wrongdoing, but rejoicing in truth. And Jesus shows what endurance in love looks like through pain and humiliation and weariness and intimidation and mockery. And you know what the crazy part? Not only did Jesus go the way that most of us would go by getting fed up and then just bailing on it, like just saying, forget you, you know, you're out. Not only that, but he went the other way and he blessed, right? What does Jesus say from the cross? Father, Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What? Pull, strip all of what you have known about this whole story. Like we, this gets lost a little bit because we're like, yeah, we know this story. We know Jesus said forgive them. Pretend like, pretend like you're hearing that for the first time. What? After all, we just highlighted how everybody has failed Jesus through the whole process. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then as he's hanging there, right? 
one of the guys on the, the, the one of the two guys that deserved to be there starts mocking Jesus. And one of the criminals who's hanging on the hanging reviled at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Right? He's being an idiot. Mocking Jesus. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and indeed justly? For we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus said, And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus is willing to have this conversation through the pain of the cross with this guy who doesn't deserve it. And bless somebody who didn't deserve blessing. And then in the middle of suffering, before Jesus breathes his last breath, Before Jesus dies, he has enough compassion. He has enough wherewithal in the midst of all of suffering to think about his mom. And when when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, John, the only guy that showed up to the cross, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. He said to the disciple, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her um, to his own home. In the midst of the hardest, most just terror, like hardest moment, Jesus thought about his mom. As the oldest child, Jesus would have been expected to make sure his mom was taken care of after his death. And Jesus, not only being abandoned by all that, by, by most of the disciples, but also by his family. Notice that it wasn't like looking around. Jesus couldn't look around and see his, his siblings hanging out there. They had all bailed too. And so he looks at John and he says, John, I need you to do something for me. And so all of this paints this picture of what we read first, right? Right? Again, sometimes we, 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 we get desensitized to the story because we've heard it so many times, but this week what I want us to do is sit with the weight of this. And it reminds us all again of what we read earlier in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so close to him. Let us run with endurance the race set for us. Run with endurance. Love with endurance the, the, as we go through life. How do we do that? We look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Another translation that I love and, and what it seems to indicate in the Greek is that that word founder is actually the word Pioneer the one who pioneers our faith, the one who shows us what faith looks like, the one who shows us and has gone out ahead of us and it shows us what love looks like. Jesus went out ahead of us and showed what love looks like and what he showed us was an enduring love who for the joy set before him, you and I benefit from this. You and I have life because of this, the joy that was set before him. What did he do? Hupomeneo, remained under When no one else would have, he did the cross, despising the shame. And now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And the third, verse 3 of Hebrews says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you don't grow weary and lose heart. It's always been about Jesus. As we look to Jesus, as we look to the cross, we not only see the endurance of Jesus, but I think what we're supposed to see too is a picture of how you and I are called to start loving, to remain under. Listen, I don't, I don't pretend that the things you've gone through and the people that you feel like have abandoned you or 
that that's an easy situation by any means. I know that each and every one of us probably in this room have dealt with, with heartache of people and relationships that are broken by people who have left, by people who have hurt, by and Jesus knows exactly how you feel. And maybe that's just what some of us need to hear today, right? Because you just felt like you've been going through this alone. You've been going through the hurt and the pain and the, the forsaken alone. And what you just maybe just you need to hear and take away from today is that Jesus, he knows. He knows exactly what you feel like. Because that's exactly what happened to him. And then Jesus shows what it looks like to remain. Even when it didn't made sense. I think this passage in Hebrews shows us, and the first bit of it, shows us some, a couple things that we can do as we look at enduring. What does enduring love look like and how do we navigate through that? Um, how do we live and love with endurance? That's the question, right? How do we live and love with the endurance that Jesus calls us to live and love with? The first thing um, that Hebrews points out is you can remove heavy things that are slowing you down, right? Notice I said heavy things, <laughs> not heavy people. Oh, that was right there. I just couldn't <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I just popped in my head right now, and I couldn't help but not say, right? Remove heavy things, not heavy people. Um, we navigate through life as, as Jesus followers oftentimes, and we just allow heavy things to drag us down. What does it say in that passage in, in Hebrews, right? He says, hey, you've got this great cloud of witness surrounding you. Therefore, lay aside the weight, every weight, and sin that, that clings so closely. Sin, if we're, gonna, if we're going to love with endurance, we've got to do something about some of that baggage that we're carrying around. We've got to do something with that baggage that's, that's carrying us down. Maybe for some of us it's sin and habits that are weighing us down, and we can't really love with endurance because we're just, we're just so caught up in our own stuff. We're so caught up in our own baggage and our own garbage that we, are, 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 we, we can't love the way God's called us to love. We're so caught up with resentment and greed or our personal, own personal goals or material things or entertainment or fears or worries or anxieties that... that that sometimes it just doesn't even feel possible to love other people because we're so caught up with our own stuff. And what the writer of Hebrews says, he says, I want, you to be, I want you to be free to love the way God has been loving. And what that's gonna take is you're gonna have to remove some of those things that are tearing you down or clinging you down. We gotta deal with, with our own stuff so that we're clear, we have a clear path to run the race without hurdles or obstacles. The other day I was flipping through, um, I don't even know why I landed on this, but I was watching track, for, track and field for a minute. And like just for a minute, because I couldn't stand it much past that. Um, and then I found baseball, which is far more entertaining to me. Um, but they were running, right? And what I caught was, it was kind of interesting. I caught um, the 100 meter um, because, you know, in track we use the metric system. Um, <laughs> that's why it's not a real sport. Okay, I'm going on a bad trail. <laughs> We're done with that, all right? So they were running the 100 meter. And you know what I noticed? They could run that really fast. And then I saw the hurdles, same distance. But that was, they, they ran it far slower. Because they had, to, I mean, because they had to jump over things, right? Like they literally, that's how, how crazy weird this sport is. They put stuff in your way that you gotta jump over. Again, we're not gonna go there. Just watch baseball, people. 
It's America's sport. Um, but they're running, and they, like, they got to jump over things. And sometimes, like, have you ever watched a hurdler jump, and they missed it, and they biffed it? Ow! Like, here's the thing. Why is that in the way? Just, just pull those out of the way, and you can run fast, right? God, this is way too logical. And I, I get it. I know it's a sport. But back to this, right? Some of you in your life, not only are you not running fast because you have baggage and you're holding yourself back, but you're also pulling hurdles into the way of your life. And because of sin or addiction or things going on, you're, you're, you're not only not running straight, you're, you're actually coming in, you're putting stuff in your way that you're gonna have to jump over and navigate around. And what Paul's saying, or what the writer of Hebrews is saying, is here, hey, take them out of the way. Don't run the hurdles. Run the sprint, right? Run, run the, the, the 100 meter dash. Don't run the hurdles. In your spiritual life, quit pulling things that are gonna be in your way that are gonna hold you back from loving people the way God wants you to love people. Get out of your own way. And then live life with endurance. Live life with endurance. And, and friends, if we're going to live life, if we're going to love with endurance like Jesus is asking, it's going to require some patience. It's going to take some long-suffering. Remember we talked about that in patience, that what it means is long-suffering. It's going to take some running with, 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 with distance in mind. Like this is the long game, right? It's going to take some... It's going to take maybe running with some, with some pace. Again, I don't know why running's coming up so much today. I don't even like running. But my wife, Beth, ran cross country for her college. Um, she was a uh, scholarship to, to run cross country. And I went to exactly one of her races because I was a great husband. And... And here's the thing about cross-country racing. You watch and you're like, oh, here they come. Yeah. And that was it. All right. Um, and then you go find another spot and you watch them come. And you're like, oh, okay. But here's the thing about cross-country, what I learned from my wife. because She reminded me of this this week. I ran with her exactly one time in our whole marriage. I've run with my wife because um, she kicked my booty. That's why. And I couldn't do it again. And so uh, I went and started running, and I was always, like, I'm always, like, a little quicker, faster. I could start faster, but, man, do I not have endurance. I learned that the hard way. And so we were running on the Springwater Trail. We were just married, and I was going to be a great husband and run with my wife, and we went down the Springwater Trail, and she start run, we start running, and I'm, like, way ahead of her. Or I'm, like, you know, I'm, like, come on, Keith. I thought you said you were a runner, you know, like, come on. And, uh, and then I realized that after about a mile, mile and a half, I was like, every step I took that direction was a step I was going to have to go back that direction. And as I was starting to slow down and peter out, she was now ahead of me saying, come on, aren't you going to keep up? And then I did the real loving and supporting thing. I said, there's a bench. I'm going to sit here. You go as long as you want and pick me up on the way back through. Because <laughs> I didn't live, I didn't run with endurance. Front. It, there, was, there was no shame in that moment. I was just dying. <laughs> what I learned about that, though, is sometimes in our spiritual lives, um, we charge out ahead. And we think we're doing great. And we're like, oh, man, what's wrong with all these people? What's wrong with all these people? And to live life with endurance sometimes means we run with a pace that's sustainable that we love with a pace that's sustainable, that we treat relationships as something long we're going to do, not just instant. And sometimes we build these friendships, these relationships, and, and the reason that we have such hard time and staying power is that we, have, we don't have love, we have affection, we have infatuation. That's why a lot of marriages aren't lasting, um, because 
A lot of times people are basing their marriage on affection and, and infatuation, not on love, not on real love, not on God's kind of love. Because if you're going to love the way God loves, it's going to take some endurance. It's going to take being there through all of it, through the thick and thin, through putting yourself under and remaining even when things aren't easy. Because that's what God shows us what love looks like. We, re- we live life and we love with endurance. And the last thing we need to do, we need to remember this in all areas of life, that we fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's why we've been, throughout this whole series, I hope you've been seeing this, that we've been fixing our eyes on Jesus over and over again. We talk about the, the, what love is, and then we go, here's how Jesus shows it. Because he was perfect at showing it. So as you struggle in your life with showing patience, with love seems impossible to live with patience, look at Jesus. When you're ready to, when you're, when you, when you don't want to be kind to this person anymore, and you remember, man, I don't, I, like, I have this thing that I could say to them right now that would make me feel so much better, but it's rude, and it's not loving, and because it's not kind, I'm not going to say it. Why? Because I'm looking at Jesus, and Jesus didn't say it. You can you imagine what Jesus could have said from the cross? what he would have felt like saying from the cross to all these people, but he didn't. And you and I shouldn't because we fix our eyes on Jesus. When we want to allow our love to be puffed up and proud rather than humble, when we want to make love all about us, when we want, to, when we want love to be in whatever it makes me happy, that we recognize that love is humble. How do I live that out? That seems so hard. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He pioneered it. We can look at him. When we want to, when we're struggling with truth and rejoicing with truth, when we want to rejoice at wrongdoing because that person, man, they deserved it. They're getting exactly what they, they should be getting. We look at Jesus who didn't rejoice at wrongdoing. Rejoice with the truth. And when we feel like giving up, when we feel like giving up on love, when we feel like at moments when, because we've been hurt so bad, maybe we feel like a little bit like Tina Turner did when she wrote that song. Man, love is just, just get what you can get out of it because there's, you might as well get at least a good feeling out of it for a little bit because it's just gonna end up breaking your heart. We refuse to buy into that world's definition of love because we have a better one. Why? Because we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorned the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you, you, me, we don't grow weary and lose heart comes to loving people. That's, friends, what love's got to do with it. It it, it has everything to do with everything. And Jesus showed it because he lived out this, what he said right in John 15, greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life. And Jesus did just that. And he's inviting you and I, however that looks in your context, to love with endurance. What's love got to do with it? Everything. 